Forza Horizon 4 has concluded the year's set of racing games. The Crew 2 was good, but then Horizon 4 got announced and everyone stopped caring. When has Horizon ever let us down? With a series that never fails to improve on itself. How far will Horizon 4 take it? Time to find out. Forza Horizon has always had incredible introductions. You've got fast cars tearing through the prettiest parts of wherever the game's set, backed by announcer ladies' invigorating sales pitch for the event. It's essentially 10 minutes of purified hype, a showcase for the best of what's to come, and the series has never done it better than here. You start off in the Senna, McLaren's new hypercar, roaring down thin British roads. There's works being done, a nice countryside home, and miles of farmland. The game wastes no time placing you in the UK's ambience. From autumn, you transition into winter, a song of ice and tires. All of a sudden, you're in a great big truck slamming onto an iced over river. Then into spring. It's a rally race against a band of motorcyclists through a damp Welsh quarry. And to top it all, summer puts you back in the centre, soaring down a massive stretch of road with Horizon 3's Centenario. The jets fly overhead, the music booms, and the doors to Horizon come closer. That is probably the most hype I've ever felt playing a racing game. Within 10 minutes, the game tantalises you with the visuals that make the competition weep, places you in an incredible range of cars, showcases the game's big season feature, and gets you used to Horizon's endlessly enjoyable racing physics. What's it going to do next? Well, Horizon 4's other step forward is supposedly the character customization, but you don't even have a choice of shirt. Like the Crew 2, the choice of avatars isn't exactly great. For all Horizon's freedom, kinda seems like even the most basic of character creators would go a long way. Once you've picked your prick, you get your first choice of cars. This is important, though not because there's massive differences between them but because they're trash. Trash in comparison to Horizon 3's choice of S-Class cars that essentially made D, C, B and A-Class pointless. A huge improvement. Horizon 4 lets you go anywhere from the get-go, officially, and by that I mean you aren't held at gunpoint to set an objective marker to whatever event the game wants you to do. So what else would you do but explore? Forza Horizon 4 is set in England, and Wales, and Scotland. Basically the UK amalgamated into one. Some natives think that this is far too nice to be a real area in the UK, and to be honest, there are a few places in England that come close. But if you find the right parts, there's beauty there like you can't see anywhere else in the world. The exact same goes for Scotland. Ireland, Wales, and Ireland especially, but for obvious reasons, Ireland didn't make the cut. I don't think there's anything in the entire series that matches the staggering beauty of the train bridge atop Glen Rannoch. It's true, the game is pretty selective with what it chooses to take from the UK. There's the signs and the houses all in order, but the roads are, um... Yeah, they're smooth. Not like a 16-year-old boy's face, which is probably the game's most jarring leap in realism. We're also lacking a Greggs, which anywhere in the UK is unrecognisable without, and there are no roadmen with puffer jackets playing Stormzy out their shitty courses as they slowly crawl round the block. You can't hear any screaming foxes at night or drunk winos shouting at everyone from the pub door. There's no threat of getting a car robbed or your shed firebombed, and shockingly, no roadworks. Not even a single one, despite the intro. It got the beauty of the land right, but not the beauty of the folks. As for how the map serves you gameplay-wise, this is easily the best arcade racing map of the decade. It blows anything from the previous entries out the water immediately, with the largest and most detailed map yet. Instead of the embarrassingly tiny surfer's paradise, Edinburgh looks exquisite, feels as large as it should, and provides more than three rows to do city-based driving in. There's also multiple drag strips, though annoyingly not one long enough to max hypercars. Thankfully, there is a strip right at the Horizon Festival, and in contrast to Horizon 3, only one Horizon Festival but it's among the largest and most detailed so far. I still feel nostalgia for the first, but there's no denying how right the music festival but with cars vibe is sold here. The map is no longer flat as it was in Horizon 3. With massive hills and valleys, you'll get plenty of air regularly, and cross-country cars have a legitimate reason to exist. Trees were by far my biggest problem with Horizon 3, and no, that's not a joke. Half the trees would disintegrate on contact, the other half would take you to a grinding halt. Have fun discerning between the two at 150 miles an hour. If you even slightly slid off the road in that game, you could bet your ass there'd be a tree ready to ruin your life. There are no longer life-ruining trees in Horizon. Instead, your punishment for going wide is smashing through bricks, which slow you down considerably. You can also easily tell which kind of tree is which, and there's a higher proportion of trees that you can break, meaning the forests are reasonably navigable without sacrificing believability. Excellent. But there's still plenty of room for improvement. The map, like every other Forza game, doesn't have enough distinct and memorable locations. The only map in recent memory that had anything close would be Need for Speed 
2015. The cool bridge, the shipping yard, the outskirts with all the drift roads. Honestly, I don't have a clue why all of a sudden 2015 sticks out in my head, but I think its map was better than I give it credit for. So what makes a memorable, distinct location? There are two criteria. They should have a stark change in visuals, which this game lacks for the most part, and a change in how you engage with it. Do you drive slow or fast? Are there a lot of corners or jumps? Can you interact with the environment, like racing a train or hitting a destructible? Edinburgh, the festival, and Glen Rannoch are the three notable memorable locations in Horizon 4. But can you name another interesting area of the map? Glen Rannoch clearly looks distinct, and has a special way of engaging with it because of how you can use the bridge. Equally true for Edinburgh and the festival, the lake arguably has both criteria in winter. And that's your lot. The difference between the motorway in this game and the bridge in Need for Speed is that one is visually boring and one is not. The difference between the towns in this game and the towns in most other races is that one can be blazed through in seconds, and the other has to be engaged with differently, because there are more corners, walls, traffic and shortcuts. For Horizon 5, I hope to see improvements in this respect more than any other, but the game does attempt to differentiate its map visually on a more meta level as a band-aid for the map variety. Horizon 4's big innovation is seasons. The aesthetic changes are so dramatic with the turnover that many roads become unrecognisable. It doesn't feel completely new, it just doesn't feel as tiresome as it did in every previous entry after a certain while, which is a big deal. The visual change affects the entire map, so you're still stuck with the same aesthetic for an entire week, a big problem when it's winter. And don't expect any significant changes beyond the visual, because aside from the lake, there aren't any. But that's probably a good thing. It's nice to access new areas of the map with seasonal changes, but losing access to many would be frustrating. If winter stopped you from driving hypercars, you'd be more than a little annoyed. Open world racing games should be consistently free, so I'm not sour that the seasons are limited to aesthetics. Seasons are the prime factor for the reason why Horizon 4 has received award after award. It's condensed hype and bottled it. Through the seasons and the graphics, but also the music and the way it feels to drive, Horizon 4 is probably the most fun you can have in the act of open world racing since well, Horizon 3. The racing physics compromise between arcade fun and passing believability, and they've clearly been well refined, because I don't think they've ever felt better. Drifts are always easy to judge and pull off, yet hard to master, which is a direct improvement over Horizon 3. And it's impressive given how well they accounted for the effects of dirt and snow on handling. The UK's bumpy off-road frequently raises wheels and shakes you off course, so cross-country, especially at high speed, is impressively tense. Sense of speed is sold by the fear of your car losing control when it's nearing the 200s, and the set itself. I don't know whether or not this is intentional, but you'll notice most roadsides have tree lines. How fast they whip past is a way of gauging how fast you're going forward. The feel of driving alone is great, but what sets it so far above the rest is how that feeling is amplified by the secondary aspects of the game's presentation. The New Horizon aesthetic steps away from white lines and towards white text atop colourful motion graphics. It's angular and blocky, which seems to primarily be in service of the grey stage you're transported to in loading. This puts emphasis on the cars and on the screen. There's no way of hyping up a showcase event better than standing tall next to your car as a fighter jet rolls up and looms overhead. Music is the final pillar here. Finally, XS has returned, giving you a wide range of music styles to choose from. The selection of tracks themselves is generally solid, but some within the same list disrupt the overall mood. Batfang's Turn It Up sounds like it belongs in an under-18s disco 30 years ago, not in the same list as Dorothy. I'd also say that individual track lists are much too small, making it really easy to get bored of a single station. But what redeems it all is that whenever you cross the line at the end of a race, the hardest part of the track will play. It will always drop specifically then. And when that happens on a great song, as you've just come first after a difficult race, Horizon 4 is a 10 out of 10. And that unparalleled presentation reaches its heights in literally spectacular form, with the franchise's trademark events, the showcases. Each one has a music track picked out specifically for it, so you'll always get the most thrilling experience possible. As fun as it is to race a rally car against dirt bikes, it's not exactly impressive when it comes after racing the Flying Scotsman through Glen Rannoch. I think this event is the most fun the laws of physics will allow anyone to have playing a racing game. And if that's not good enough, there's even a showcase specifically themed around Halo. The Halo experience is essentially a warthog run, same as usual. A high-octane, nail-bitingly tense tumble through something that is almost definitely about to explode. In this case, it's the entire Halo ring, which they changed the skybox for. Jen Taylor, as always, voices Cortana, though I'm not sure if there's any new lines. Given the Halo 
content drought. This is the most recent Chief and Cortana moment we've had since 2015. They reuse assets from the previous games and paste them in to make it more Halo-y, which occasionally works even better than the main games, as the pelican flying overhead causes controller rumble. It's fantastic. Unsurprisingly, this is a time trial instead of a race, but the experience is what it said on the tin, and that's exactly what you get. Horizon is an experience. That's its ace in the hole, and why people can come away from playing 10 hours of the game, telling everyone it's a masterpiece. But it's not. Peel back the surface a little, and we'll see that Horizon 4 isn't quite the glimmering gem it's made out to be. Let's talk progression. Throughout the summer season, you'll slowly be introduced to all the facets of Horizon racing. Very slowly. The introductions are as simple as racing games get. The four series are introduced with a fun starter event, and as you play, more will show up on the map. For this game, we've got road races, street races, dirt races, and cross country. That's only four, so I don't think anyone's gonna get confused by what a speed trap is or what stunt story mode does. Yet the game feels the need to tutorialize them. I can't believe basic features like change car or auto show are locked until you get to autumn. I also can't believe that the game starts forcing you to set routes after the tutorial section. The game is strangely slow to get going, as if it wants to accommodate people who've never touched a racing game before. I'm sure anyone can figure out that dirt racing events refer to dirt racing, and that to get points on a jump you need to drive your car towards the jump. Yet there's nothing to explain anything regarding online play or credit progression. Much of this could have been avoided if there was some manner of tutorial mode that explained what influence and credits do, how to tune your car, how to use the marketplace. But instead, everyone gets the same tutorial that most people will be bored by, and the small minority of newcomers will be both patronized and not helped by at the same time. Horizon 3 had this nailed far better, seasons or not. The meat of Horizon 4 isn't complicated. You compete in events on the map whenever you please. As you complete races, you level up within the series, putting you into the next round, which is essentially just more available races. As far as I'm aware, there's 70 of these events in total. And while that might seem low, it's easily enough to keep you playing new content for tens of hours. Of course, as you complete events, you'll accumulate credits and also influence. Credits are obviously for buying new stuff, but influence is your meta progression, your long-term goals. Pre-Horizon roster, you need a certain amount of influence to progress into each season, and within each season to get a showcase event. Post Horizon roster, influence and therefore the boards you can smash to get it are utterly meaningless. So its real function is a fancy way of pacing out the events and features early on. When you get to an arbitrary round within a series, you'll access a championship event, which is really just a long race that you need to win in order to become champion of whatever that series is. Do this for each series and you'll access the Goliath, which is a race encompassing the entire map. That's essentially the game's final boss fight, but there'll still be loads of events to compete in even after you're champion. I'll start with the good stuff. It's very well streamlined. The other good thing is that there are 40 extra events in the game that aren't marked with icons on the map, and they're all part of the four story campaigns, as the game calls it. The first one is Stunt Driver, where you work for Sean Bean as a stuntman on a movie. The events typically just drive all the way to the stunt location and then do something epic, like a jump or high speed. Getting to try out the Bugatti Chiron on your first event was a very smart way of getting players hooked. The other story campaigns include Drift, which is what you'd imagine, World's Fastest, which is where you max hypercars, and most impressively, La Racer, which is a series of callbacks to older racing games. You've got a crazy taxi event, a Daytona event, it's good stuff. The game essentially puts you in the coolest situations it can think of and lets you have fun. So it's like the bucket list from Horizon 3, just better in every way. Now let's move on to the bad. The game doesn't tell you about any of them but the first one. After your first chapter, you have to go back to this dead yellow icon to continue it. How are you supposed to know that? Why aren't they spread across the map? Why is the world's fastest icon hidden behind other races? Why aren't they just like the normal racing series with the final event? Because as it stands, they feel like a waste of time. People see the Goliath as the final event, doing stunts doesn't help you get there. They're a brilliant addition, marred by the person who thought that even a small yellow glow around the edge of these icons to tell you that you can continue wouldn't be appropriate. 40 events that a significant amount of people won't bother with is bad enough, but it's one of many progression and content oversights that bring the entire experience down. Let's list them off. Number 1. The progression early game is hugely impacted by what version you bought. You'll end up with a gold zonda straight off the bat if you buy the ultimate edition, and you'll have enough money by the end of the first race to buy pretty much anything in B and mostly everything in A class. Forza Horizon 3 started you off in an S class in all editions, so we've made progress from that. But I don't understand why ruining the progression of a game is a reward for spending more money. You don't have to drive your zonda, but you're stuck with the extra money and everything you'll get from the VIP pass, which includes double credit wheel spins 
spins, loads more wheel spins, a $5 million house for free, cars and customization items. Why would you want to pay to remove reasons to play? It's entirely the player's choice to buy a more expensive edition, but I don't think many of those players will appreciate getting a drastically different experience from everyone else. Number 2. The character customization wasn't as good as I hoped. I picked Russell Howard over the others because I thought he'd look right at home drinking lager and doing donuts in Tesco car park, but by the end he was a dabbing nonce wearing a budget Elton John cosplay. It's not as if I had any say in this. My other option was just to use the default crap, because every item you get is entirely random. You'll get a pair of yellow wellingtons for getting to the next round of cross country. You'll get a gold skirt from a wheel spin. My nan's bingo prizes are better than that. And even worse, it's slow. A round of racing is about three events, and you'll get an item one in three or four wheel spins. So even by the time I'd become champion in two of the four racing series, it was Elton John or John Smith. It's genuinely funny to me that a pair of yellow Wellingtons are as difficult to get as a Lamborghini Huracan. Number 3. Some dirt races and cross-country races could be in either category. The only thing that distinguishes them is what type of car you use by default. I've raced cross-country that's entirely on a dirt circuit, and I've raced dirt tracks that are half tarmac. I don't get how they pick which is which. You don't even have to use different cars. The problem is even worse considering street and road racing. They're both on the road, they both let you use any car by default most of the time. They both vary from long routes to short and tight. So what distinguishes the two? Well, street races are always at night, and road races can be at any time. That's it. And there's not even a point. Nighttime street races are only cool because they create the illegal street scene underground vibe. Which isn't exactly what comes to mind when I think of a music festival in Edinburgh. It's irritating because much of the time I'll bring the wrong car for an event. These should be four reliably different experiences. If only the game had another 30 events that could provide unique experiences. Number 4. This is a big one. The credit progression is completely messed up. Among the most confusing things about the game is the fact that there's no credit or influence difference depending on where you place. And this is so absolute that you could turn off every assist and put on the hardest driver tires to get extra credit gain, then come last in every event. You'd earn more credits from doing that than if you won events on normal. Furthermore, on average, you're going to make about 10k credits per race across the duration of the game. But at the same rate, you'll be making far more in wheel spin money. Difference is, you can bet on the race credits. You sure as hell can't bet on winnings from a slot machine. On my first super wheel spin, I got 400,000 credits. You might get none. You might get credits every time. I got more horns than anything else. Credits are down to luck, not skill. Not everyone will progress at a similar rate, even if they have the same level of skill. Unlike games with a skill tree, you do not progress to become more powerful. The rival driver tars scale with you, so you'll rarely be over or under leveled for an event. Instead, you'll be progressing up the car classes. You're getting faster and better looking. That's your continued reward. But it's not forever. Top level is 999. You start out at around 750. So having a wheel spin give you enough money to jump to an 850 just like that feels a little wrong. Not rewarding. This isn't as bad as it sounds, because even though you can, you're more than likely not going to use the same car for everything. And it's not as if having one high-leveled car will stop you from wanting others. You might want to use the crappiest cars you can buy in a late game event, and that's no problem. The game's just free that way. But it still feels unrewarding to be able to skip from using mid-tier cars to having a supercar. 50,000 is fine, but 400,000 is enough for a legendary Audi R8 and plenty to spare. However, this all changes when you make your way into the end game. By now, the only cars you'll want to buy are S-Class, and you only make about 10k per event, making credit progression far slower. So once again, it's back to the wheel spins, though this time you're begging for the high credit reward so you can gain cars at a reasonable rate. I can't gauge how good my luck was, but it was luck. For the average player, I don't know if it was better or worse than my experience, but either way, having the largest leaps in progression being down to a lottery means that not only is credit gain unsatisfying, but it also means there will be significant extremities, people in the highest and lowest 0.05 probability on the distribution, half of whom complete their progression rapidly and have little reason to play much of the content, and the other half of whom barely budge, get stuck in the same car for ages, and then just quit. These wheel spin problems would have been a lot easier to correct if credit gain from events were properly balanced around the player's garage, or better yet, wheel spins were less garbage. First, rid them of tat such as golden skirts and emotes. Second, reduce the range of possible credit gains from wheel spins, so it won't be 400,000 one spin and 5,000 the next, you'd have a range closer to the mean. So 400,000 goes down to 200,000, but maybe 5,000 goes up to 20,000. This way you maintain the same mean credit gain for all players, but significantly reduce the amount of players whose luck makes the game unfun. That's what I've got, I hope Playground can come up with something better by Horizon 5. 
Number 5. Everything post Horizon roster is critically flawed. The three main features the game pitches is multiplayer, Forzathon, and seasonal events. Being on the roster means you're on the 7 day season cycle, and there's no getting out of that. Thankfully, winter isn't a hellhole to drive in, and you can still use your hypercars as long as you don't intend on maxing. The seasons also bring exclusive barn finds and seasonal events, which is a very Destiny-esque way of getting you to come back each week. Trouble is, seasonal events are a joke, primarily because they have nothing to do with the season. There's no reason this Super Saloon event has to be in winter, so why is it seasonal? Why isn't it just an event? Which is what these are, but structured like championships. There's a series of three or four races in a championship. Winning it doesn't get you much, even coming first is worse prize than you'd get for losing every individual event. The James Bond one that might have caught your eye could be good, probably isn't, but unless you've bought the DLC, there's no way for you or I to tell. The other big new feature is Forzathon. On the hour, every hour, a blimp appears somewhere in the map, and everyone in your session can dash over to it to take part in a series of challenges. It gives you something different and social to do regularly in play. It even gives you exclusive rewards, which could potentially make it a worthwhile event. But that's where the good stuff ends. There is no proportionality between reward and your individual contribution to the total group score. Everyone on the Horizon roster should have a car fast enough to make significant contribution. So it shouldn't be about stopping rich get richer. Worse than that, the challenges themselves aren't fun unless you join late, because you're doing the same activities in near enough the same way for five minutes at a time. Imagine finding a speed camera on the road, then just going up and down the road continuously hitting it. That's literally Forzathon. Imagine finding a random hill with one meager jump and being told to get air skills. So you just drive back and forth over the same ramp, getting a small amount of air each time. That's literally Forzathon. It's a collection of skill zones, but instead of being something fun to do while driving around, which is what they're there for, it's the prime focus. But the biggest issue with Forzathon by far is getting into it. You first have to be connected to Horizon Life, which you're in and out of constantly. You have to not be doing anything else, which includes a race or working at the festival during the tick of the hour. And then you have to be in driving distance. You can't fast travel to Forzathon unless you've bought Fairlawn Manor, which gives you infinite fast travel. You need to drive there, which means oftentimes you physically can't make it unless you get lucky and it's right next to you. So the only way of reliably arriving on time is by setting off the moment the 10 minute warning appears. 5 minutes to connect to Horizon Life, and another 5 to get to the destination. It's like arriving to an airport an hour early. It's just annoying, and not worth it when the rewards range from some pink boots to a pair of mittens. If you get enough points for a car, you'd be inefficient to buy it because you could just buy it for cheap from the auto show. Spend your points on a Mimi customization option instead. Even the Forza Edition cars can be bought from the marketplace for fairly low because they never have anything high-end on offer. Forzathon is a brilliant idea, but executed legendarily badly. I won't touch on multiplayer in any detail because I don't have the knowledge, but I will say that matchmaking takes horrendously long and I fell through the map on my first team adventure. Those are the problems with the progression. Even problems with the later game content can directly affect your willingness to try and go any further. I don't know how the game could have this many problems. It might be because of how much time they focused on the seasons, or maybe the entire project needed more time in the oven. But now I want to talk about Horizon. Not just the series, but also the festival itself, and how Playground present it. If there's anything no one has ever liked about Horizon, it's the characters. Enter our cast of cardboard utes. And by utes, I don't mean the Australian cars waste men, I mean young people. And by young people, I mean what marketing departments think young people are. Enthusiastic? Mm. Successful? No. Ready to give away a 5 million credit house to some random rude boy? Definitely not. It's the same with every racing game of the modern age. It's part of modernizing the idea of climbing up the ladder of an illegal street racing crew. Now we're climbing up the ladder of social media and internet popularity. Most games have made that transition well, but racing game devs can't write worth a damn. Before, we had entertaining ridiculous characters like those from Most Wanted 2005. What we have now, and in practically every other racing game in recent memory, are so bland that you could cure insomnia just by listening to them. Rebecca, Joel, Jaimin, Alex, Kira. Characters with no character traits. What's especially hilarious is that Jaimin, Alex, and Joel all introduce themselves with practically the same sentence. They start talking to you out of nowhere. I heard about the stunts you pulled for Joel. You know how to drive, don't you? Wow, you really are the image of Frankie Beaumont. Hey, I'm hearing good things about you. Say sorry for getting ahead of themselves. Oh, sorry. 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 Then tell you their names and what they do. Joel Carter, Horizon Driver Relations. Sorry, I'm Alex. I run dirt racing for the festival. My name's Jay. I might have something that'll interest you. Three people, same sentence. 
Not looking good. They're hype men, like Playground themselves telling you what to do next and how much you're gonna love this event. Perhaps this would have worked better if the voice talent didn't read their lines like the game was a TV ad. I'll let Kira slide, but everyone else is nail-bitingly terrible, including and especially the radio DJs. Jokes aside, we're not asking for much, and if this cannot change, then maybe the festival will have to. The reason I appreciate the season so much is because they're innovative. The Crew 2 is a good game, not great, yet it restored my faith in the open world race genre because it proved that it was capable of innovating, of changing, of becoming something more. Horizon 4 joins this trend, and it makes me excited to see what Ghost have got up their sleeves for next year. But Horizon as a franchise is unchanging. The seasons and the map are not enough. Need for Speed has a list of issues even Lindsay Lohan couldn't match, but at least the game changes significantly between releases. This is what Horizon needs to survive as a genre, because on its track people will get bored. It's a racing game, it can't rely on the gargantuan loyal audience of an FPS. There were complaints of sameness when Horizon 3 launched. What's gonna happen with Horizon 6 in four years time? The series goes for the same structure every time. It comes up with one new innovative feature, but it seems to give little focus to the end game or any feature past the core gameplay loop. Every time the theme is a car-based music festival. Extremely enticing the first time, but given that they're utterly unwilling to experiment with the idea of a festival, it gets boring fast. Cookie cutter characters who serve as irritating hype men. There's not even a marginal narrative element to the festival since the first game. Horizon can still be an institution, but does it need to be a music festival every time? Does it even need to be Horizon? Forza can still do open world games without being attached to that name. Supposedly, Horizon 5 will be set in Japan, and as cool as that sounds, it's just a setting. Will it retain the seasons feature? How will it innovate? We'll see, but it's got a ton of heavy lifting to do before the series can reach its potential. Horizon as an idea doesn't have to adhere to the series formula, but it probably will. If it does, then it's going to need to sort out its weaker elements fast. A complete redesign of Forzathon from the ground up, dramatically improved matchmaking, smoother consistency of credit progression, rewarding players who win, and most importantly to me, sorting character customization or aborting character customization. I've heard that car sounds in Horizon 4 are awful. I haven't noticed anything, but if Horizon wants to keep its petrol head audience, this is another checkbox. Less importantly, but ideally, we'd also have more interesting map design, proper distinguishing of the racing series from each other, marking the game's story campaigns on the map, and putting the game on Steam. Exclusivity continues to hurt Forza as a franchise. Keeping it on Xbox is understandable, but Windows Store is a joke. If they did it with Halo Wars, they can do it for Forza. This isn't a franchise that needs saving. But if they continue to repeat their mistakes, it will be. Until then, Horizon 4 is the best open world racing game we've had since Horizon 3. This series continues to stay on top. This game is lucky that it had three spectacular titles before it, that gave us the barn finds, the photo mode, the insane car list, handling unparalleled by its competition, and that AI that doesn't need to rely on rubber banding. It's not as good as I hoped, but it's another step forward for the open world racing genre. But we're not ending the video there. Other than the most hardcore Forza fans, few people will have heard of FACR Dan. The Forza community is not big, but it is full of dedicated, skilled, and caring fans, like few other racing games can match. Dan is one of them, but he suffers from muscular dystrophy. It's a fight for him, and the NHS can't provide enough. There's a Just Giving page to help him get a new wheelchair, so if you can donate, the link's in the description. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this, I've also got reviews and critiques on The Crew 2 and Need for Speed Payback. Even a huge variety of other non-racing games too, like the recently released Spider-Man. If you're interested in them or more content, consider subscribing. Thanks again.